Welcome to Discovering True Health, where our goal is to provide you with cutting-edge health information through research, interviews with experts, and personal journeys to true health. Our message is a message of hope and healing, and our mission is to bring you on a journey to discovering true health, to not only find wellness, but to thrive. Hello and welcome to Discovering True Health, your weekly deep dive into health and wellness. Thank you so much for joining us today. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our upcoming shows. We also have a lot more great information on our website, Instagram, or Facebook. All those links are below. So today we're going to be talking about psychedelics and mushrooms and how they can positively impact our health. And we'll specifically be talking about psilocybin, which is found in a type of mushroom referred to as magic mushrooms. And we'll be talking about the health benefits of some of the powerful non-psychedelic mushrooms as well. So I myself have taken psilocybin mushrooms in what's called microdosing when I was recovering from CV-19, and it really helped reduce and eliminate my anxiety attacks. So I've personally experienced the benefits of it. Now, federal law still prohibits personal possession and therapeutic use of entheogenic plants and fungi, but in 2020, the state of Oregon was the first state that made magic mushrooms legal. And in 2021, the city of Detroit has also decriminalized use and possession. So we're really seeing a shift towards legalization. And there's also been a lot of research around the therapeutic effects of psychedelics. Since early 2020, the John Hopkins Center for Psychedelic and Consciousness Research has been exploring innovative treatments using psilocybin. And some of the outcomes of their research are, it's been found that it eases anxiety in people with life-threatening cancer. It produced rapid and large reductions or remission in depressive symptoms. And they've also found it as a possible treatment for alcohol abuse and has helped, uh, helped longtime smokers quit. So my guest today is Peter Renato. He's a founder and CEO of Guella Mushrooms, which is a brand house and life sciences company. And they are on a mission to make psychedelics more accessible and help people use them safely and effectively. They recently launched Mojo, a nutraceutical that mimics the benefits of microdosing without psilocybin. So it's completely legal and accessible to everyone. And we're gonna be learning about that later in the show. So thank you so much for joining me today, Peter. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. All right, so let's first talk about what microdosing is and start with the basics. When it was first introduced to me, I was hesitant. I didn't want to have the intense hallucinations that scared me. Um, so I did a lot of research on it and spoke to experts before I was com comfortable trying microdosing. So can you walk us through what microdosing is and what one could expect to feel and experience? So microdosing typically refers to the practice of taking what's called a sub-perceptual dose of a entheogenic substance or a psychedelic substance. Now it could apply to a variety of different things, but in the, you know, this conversation we'll, we'll talk about psychedelics. So what I mean by sub-perceptual is you're not actually feeling the psychedelic effects of the substance you're taking. You're taking a very small amount. Typically, it could be between 10 and 25 micrograms. Um, you're taking it in a protocol. So a lot of protocols are, say, three days on, two days off, two days on. So there's a variety of different ways to do it. But it's the practice of taking a very small amount to get uh, short-term and long-term uh, mental health and cognitive um, uplift. So a lot of people talk about microdosing and one why they do it, the benefits. Typically it revolves around improved mood and uh, kind of creativity and cognitive enhancements, um, you know, better, better thought processes, better kind of clarity of thought, things like that. Now it's worth saying at the top of this that there isn't actually that much great data around microdosing yet. There's a ton of uh, qualitative and subjective uh, data and, and kind of feedback from people that are microdosing. A lot of positive data suggests that it does do stuff. Um, but it's, we've only really just started to see uh, companies doing research into scientific research into microdosing. And so kind of we're all eagerly awaiting what that data is going to look like. But 
from the self-reported data that we've got from say you know 15 years of people doing their stuff it, it really seems to help people specifically with mood disorders got it yeah i remember when i was looking into it um the the man i was speaking to when i was trying to you know find more information he kind of explained to me as like you know imagine you know if you have some sort of hobby like for example playing the piano and you normally have like a limit you know is this is kind of your 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 talent limit or mental limit but you microdose and you can your brain will kind of create more connections and you can go beyond beyond what you could do before right right yeah i mean people that take psilocybin and, and psychedelics uh, they typically report things like being able to think you know slightly differently uh, whether it's micro or, or macro dosing there's a lot of discussion around what's called the default mode network which is a, a process in our brain that helps us think in a very specific way and that's very helpful with day-to-day -day tasks but it's not you know particularly helpful if we get into negative thought patterns or if we want to think differently and so that's where psychedelics can come into play is that it can kind of knock us out of this you know very regimented default mode network and allow us to think differently that allows us to address say trauma or anxiety or allows us to be a little bit more creative in our day-to-day -day life now you mentioned you know there's not a ton of research um done yet on microdosing but your company has done a lot of extensive research research from individuals what what are some of the physiological benefits of microdosing that you've found or kind of documented? Yeah, I mean, so the reason why there's not great data yet is obviously because it's been you know illegal. Um, and ever since there was a lot of kind of there was a flurry of research, good research in the 50s, 60s, when all of this began in the West with Tim Leary and Ram Das and people like that. And then Nixon's war on drugs kind of came about, you know, 60s, 70s shut down all of this very positive research, mainly because it overlapped too much with, you know, uh, anti-war pro protests and things like that. It was just a little bit too much for the establishment. So they stopped all of this research and then it, it started to pick back up in the you know early 90s with Johns Hopkins and MAPS and people like that. But most of the research has been around uh, macro dosing. Uh, so that's where we have a lot of good data. What macro dosing, taking large doses, can do for people's uh, you know, depressive states or anxiety, or now we're starting to see really interesting work done on addiction. But we, you know, there's three or four companies that are starting to look at microdosing from a product and pharmaceutical standpoint. They're doing all of the clinical trials right now, but there's all of this you know, vast array of data that's been collected for, for a while on people that you know, have, have been doing it and self-reporting it. Like I said, it all stems around uh, mood, and mood disorders and uh, creativity and allowing us to think a little bit differently. There's, there's been a lot of interest around what, what uh, psilocybin can do from uh, a neurogenesis standpoint, which simply means kind of nerve growth. And there's some decent data to show that psilocybin, both small and, and, and large doses can help with that process, which would explain the kind of slight improvement of cognition that we feel um, when we're taking psilocybin, whether it's small or large. So um, it's, it's really exciting time. We're seeing a bunch of research. Tons of people are starting to microdose and experiment and explore these natural toolkits for addressing, you know, chronic kind of conditions that are treatment resistant. Um, so you know, a, lot of, a lot of people as well with microdosing, they talk about this idea of plant-based Adderall um, so Adderall, you know, a lot of people are very, very familiar with ADHD. Um, a lot of people take it that don't have ADHD because they want that kind of that slight, well, not slight, heavy energy lift and that focus and that kind of intense nootropic feel. Yeah. Uh, but it also is a, it works very well as a kind of mood stabilizer. So not necessarily an upper or a downer helps stabilize. It does its job well, but Adderall also has all of these toxic um uh, downsides to taking it it's kind of addictive and you know it gives you jittery right. feeling and so um it'll be interesting to see whether we can start replacing some of these you know heavy pharmaceuticals with plant-based alternatives and it could be in it doesn't just have to be just psilocybin i think we're going to start exploring a variety of different stacks that we can kind of 
uh, stack together and they work synergistically. So, you know, I've seen microdosing protocols with um, psilocybin plus lion's mane, which is a type of mushroom, plus niacin. You take those things together, niacin opens up, dilates the, the blood vessels. Lion's mane really helps with absorption. And then psilocybin is the kind of active, bioactive ingredient in there. So we're just on the tip of seeing all of this research into this, you know, natural botanical designer drug toolkit that we have that has been artificially suppressed by regulations for so long. Fascinating. So microdosing, you don't get the hallucinogenic effects. Macrodosing, you do. And there's health benefits to both. But for the most part, all the studies so far have been on macrodosing, not microdosing. All of, most of the studies have been around taking large doses and typically doing some kind of therapy at the same time. The early ones were all, you know, that's where all the studies like you know, people that take psilocybin, uh, four out of five report that it was the most profound, you know, life-changing experience that they've, they've ever had. All of that stuff came out of, you know, early Johns Hopkins studies. And it's, it's, it's fascinating, really. And, and beyond psilocybin and uh, LSD and things like that, we're now looking into MDMA, which, you know, everybody knows is a kind of party drug. Molly, um, in the 90s in the UK, certainly it was popular in its form in ecstasy with ravers and things like that, but it was actually invented as a, a therapeutic aid. Relationship, um, relationship therapy, wasn't it? Right, right. Yeah. So Shulgin built this really as a kind of empathy machine that would allow people to um, look at trauma or negative experiences, but look at it in a way that you weren't experiencing it. And that's really the goal. That's really what you want in therapy. You want to be able to look at something, address it, and then, but not feel the pain of that trauma, and then reintegrate that new behavior into your day-to-day -day life. And so MDMA is this incredible substance that allows you to feel kind of love and happiness and empathy, and it allows you to reflect on past issues, trauma, uh, address it in a therapeutic session, and then integrate those new, new, new behaviors. So we're really on the tip of that stuff. We're just seeing all of these treatments come out yeah you, you, you talk about addiction or ptsd but you know couples therapy and any of these kind of things could be incredibly valuable family therapy you know allowing families to get together and talk openly about problems but not actually feeling the anger of those problems so it's an exciting time in in kind of i would say call it you know pharmaceutical and, and therapy but also it's a really exciting time in personal growth and self-growth and kind of natural uh, medicine that people can take these substances and, and regain what they've lost. Fascinating. So it kind of creates that space between, you know, I'm not my emotions, creates that space between your, you, the you, your soul, and kind of your emotions and your mind. So you can kind of see them as separate and then kind of deal with, deal with whatever you're dealing with and integrate, like you said. Exactly, exactly. And it, obviously the therapy is a big part of that. Um, but it doesn't always require that kind of therapy. You know, the, the, a lot of the companies that are in the space now, they're very much of the pharmaceutical clinical bent. We're going to see a lot of value from that. But of course, these substances, you know, MDMA aside, psilocybin, ayahuasca, things like that, they've all been traditionally used outside of this very strict kind of medicalized pharmaceutical framework and have been giving people positive, meaningful experiences for a long time. So one of the things we're really trying to work on at Guella is building up or enabling access for responsible, intentional use that isn't just restricted to this very gate-kept pharmaceutical, uh, clinical kind of framework. You know, we want people to be able to use these substances for whatever reason, but also be able to use them responsibly and intentionally and safely because there are right you know there are potential downsides and risks and anybody that's experienced a, a bad trip knows that it's it's not fun and so you want to be able to mitigate that stuff and you can mitigate it with good planning and you know good integration and, and good set and setting and things like that yeah i was gonna ask what are what are some of the tools you re would recommend to you know if you're macro dosing to help kind of facilitate that experience so it's positive and you're doing it responsibly and so you have a positive experience and also you know integrating 
what you've learned after the fact. Yeah, I mean, you want to, the, the basics would really be, you know, you want to be able to plan ahead. So you want to make sure you're, at, you know, you've got a day when you haven't got commitments, you haven't all of a sudden got to pick up the kids, at, you know, from school or something like that. Or you know, So clear out a calendar day. You want to do it with people that you you trust. Um, you know, you really want a sitter that's not tripping, preferably that can be with you, that's got some experience with it. Um, you know, you you really want to set intentions before the trip. And, you know, I used to think of this kind of stuff as a little bit woo-woo, setting intentions, and like but it genuinely helps getting in the right frame of mind, writing stuff down. I really want this to come out of this. And, you know, I, I want this for my life and things like that, just to get yourself on the right track and mental framework. You want to be in the right set and setting mentally, but also physically. I mean, you probably don't want to be taking a bunch of psilocybin underneath fluorescent lights, you know, in a horrible, you know, concrete jungle or something like that. Typically people like nature and, you know, comfortable exactly. with cozy settings. And, and then you want to be able to take those learnings and integrate them successfully that, you know, a lot of people have these amazing experiences, but they kind of leave them out there and just return to their old thought patterns. People talk about altered states for altered traits um, and so you want to be able to take the, those experiences you have on altered states of mind and turn them into altered traits updated traits in your day-to-day -day life that's really important and I think you know integration is obviously a big part of that and, but that does it that doesn't just apply to you know trips or things like that I mean I, I'm sure we've all experienced you know going to meditation or yoga and you know, you're as calm as a Hindu cow during the ceremony, but then you come out and you get in a traffic jam and then, you know, you turn into the same asshole that you were, you know, an hour and a half ago. Like you really want to be able to take those experiences and apply them into your day-to-day -day life. So that's what you really want is habit building, habit formation and, and integration. Mean, intentional integration is a big part yes. of that. I love that. Yeah, I mean, really utilizing it as a tool like meditation or one of these other type, other types of tools that we utilize and taking those things and, you know, shifting ourselves consciously with what we learn mm -hmm. at, at that other level. Now, are there any negative physiological effects from microdosing or macrodosing? For example, MDMA depletes serotonin. Does microdosing or macrodosing cause any imbalances in the body of that nature? Or are there any negative long-term effects that have been documented? So with a, as a risk profile, psilocybin has probably the lowest risk profile out of any of the known drugs that people typically take. There's a great chart, you know, that you can look up um, with, Alcohol is very high, cigarettes are very high, heroin, things like that. Um, but psilocybin has a very low risk profile. Now, that's not to say that there is no risk. Um, certainly, there's a profile of people that probably shouldn't take these substances. Schizophrenics, uh, people with a very fragile kind of state of mind. Certainly, by themselves, they should kind of worry about taking these types of things. So you, you definitely need to think carefully about doing this stuff. And then on the physiological side, uh, there, there isn't great research yet, but what some people are concerned about, because these, these work on your serotonin receptors, so there is some concern that regular use, um, continued regular use without kind of off periods and stuff can overstimulate your um, serotonin receptors, and so you kind of get this dependency through that, but there's no clear evidence yet, and I think kind of cycling on and off will mitigate anything like that. And obviously, you know your body best, but I think it's TBD on the physiological side, but what, what is known is there's, it, it's got a very low risk profile. There's no, certainly no kind of toxic overhead with taking these substances, certainly compared to things like, like Adderall, <laughs> Adderall or alcohol or any of these right. SSRIs and things like that. Got it. Okay. Now, are there different strains of magic mushrooms that create different types of experiences or healing benefits? For example, I know with marijuana, there are different types. Some elicit you to be more awake, some more tired. Does Do psilocybin mushrooms have variation or is it kind of the same across the board? So there's a ton of uh, strains out there tons I mean I've got a spreadsheet in front of me actually I was doing some work on a, a database before this 
um, where you know there's, there's you know, and there's there's new ones popping up all the time. It's just like cannabis. There's you know crossbreeding and things like that. Now the question: Do different strains do different things? Is actually a controversial one in this world. Um, a lot of people think they do. So there's you know more euphoric ones, more trippy ones, more kind of ones where you're more in your head, cerebral ones. But there's no good data for that yet. Um, now, there's definitely more potent and less potent ones. So uh, Penis MD, for example, great name, um, <laughs> is, is, the, is one of the most potent ones. So you take a by kind of weight um, uh, of Penis MD compared to, say, Golden Teacher, and you'll get a trip of a lot more. It's because it's got a lot more bioactive uh, in there. But whether or not um, they have different kind of characteristics based on strain is, is, is debatable. Re Self-reported data though, people do say that there is. So um, Golden Teacher, people talk about it being a lot more cerebral, penis envy. They talk you know, a lot more about being you know, kind of visuals. And so it's, it's really interesting, but there isn't hard data either way yet. So we'll, we'll have to wait and see on that. But like I said, the thing to really watch out for is the potency. If you're going for, you know, these albino strains or penis MB, you're, you're taking the same amount in gram form, you're going to have a much bigger trip. And so if you're microdosing on Golden Teacher with 25 milligrams, you probably only need five to 10 of the, the penis MB or albino. Got it. So it's the, the, the amount of psilocybin in milligrams that's in. Exactly. Yeah. But potency, we definitely know that some mushrooms are a lot stronger than others and they've been bred to be that way. Fascinating. And how many would you say that have been documented different strains so far? Let's see how many fields on my database that I've got in front of me. I think I've got at least 200 on here. Wow. Um, 150. And then there's a bunch, you know, most of them are uh, psilocybin cubensis, um, which is this kind of standard strain, but there's, there's, psilocybe mexicana alieni and there's, there's just a bunch of these things that are being some being discovered some being bred and updated so we'll, we'll see a lot more of that stuff to go. but there's really like if people are um starting to to get into this there's really a, only a few that people take there's you know golden teacher b plus things like that and then there's these these stronger ones as well um, but if i was just getting into this space the the, the commonly found ones are are perfectly fine it's not like it's a bit different to cannabis where you've got these rare genetics and cultivars that do different things different thc yes but there's different terpenes that do different things mushrooms seem to be a lot simpler than that okay fascinating it'll be really fascinating to see once they get more into the research of all this you know if there's different health benefits from these different strains completely i mean we don't, we're, we're just starting to understand the entourage effect of a lot of the things that are in these substances. So, you know, the entourage effect is how all of these substances within the mushroom work together uh, synergistically. And we, we know that happens in, in cannabis. So if you just extract THC, you're going to get a very different experience than taking the whole flower. And it'll be the same here, which is why we don't know yet whether pharmaceutical grade uh, psilocybin is going to be the same as, uh, you know, just taking some dry mushrooms, whether it's got all of the active ingredients that balance things out and make it a, a you know, a good experience or trip. Right. Because they're changing mother nature and hmm. processing and all that sort of thing. So exactly. exactly. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Now, currently, as we talked about before, psilocybin is not legalized in most states yet. It's slowly becoming legal more and more in different areas. So your company has come up with a really great legal alternative that mimics the effects of a psilocybin microdose experience. So can you share with us what Mojo is, what's the science behind it, and what was the inspiration and intention behind the creation of it? Yes, yeah, so Mojo has been kind of a 10-year process, certainly for our chief science officer. Um, so Daniel, he's a scientist, um, and he started working on a formula 10 years ago when he was at university, he wanted a, you know, he wanted something that helped him study, that helped him with work, that helped him with focus, energy. And he, he did use a lot of the kind of things we've been talking about, Adderall and any of these new, new tropics out there and just didn't like the downsides. So we started to 
play around with natural alternatives. Um, Mojo V1 was really his study aid. And so when we founded Guella two years ago, we came up with the idea of, look, people really want a microdose. They're reporting all of these great benefits. And we looked at you know, what the four categories really were. And it typically was you know, energy, uh, focus, uh, cognition, and then this kind of mood um, enhancement or mood balancing. And so we knew we wanted to create something that activated those four kind of areas, but we wanted to do it without using anything illegal um, and to give people a bridge into this world to allow people to use these substances, to get the benefits without having to do anything illegal, but also just to create a, you know, a cool product that people could take, even if they do take the illegal substances, they can take this you know, on a plane or, you know, when they don't have something or just, you know, as a day to day support. And Daniel actually built it to work well with psilocybin or work, you know, not with psilocybin. And so that's where it came from. We wanted to build something that mimicked the pharmacologically mimicked the benefits without having to rely on psilocybin. And so the first iteration was uh, you know, a couple of years ago, and we've we've gone through probably 50 iterations. Um, we to start with, it was it was like injecting rocket fuel into your veins. I mean, it was completely <laughs> intolerable to me and I'm very sensitive to kind of, you know, stimulant type of effects. So it's been a process of dialing in the stimulants, uh, dialing in the kind of the, the up, but also leveling it out with the mood balancers. We wanted to make something that gave people energy, but didn't give you that afternoon crash like coffee. We wanted it to be leveled out. So we put mood balancers like L-theanine in there and things like that. So where it's en ended up is this gummy, uh, which again, it took a long time to get to this place because bioactives are typically not that tasty. So, mm -hmm. you know, we had went through a lot of iterations to make it actually tasty for people. So it's a tasty gummy. Um, it's got 14 different bioactives. All of them are legal. Um, it's kind of plant-based. So we've got a variety of different mushrooms in there, functional mushrooms. We've got some uh, botanicals, nootropics in there. And essentially you, you kind of take it and you get four to six hours of what we call flow state. So there's kind of focused energy, but it's not like Red Bull where you kind of get punched in the face with this caffeine experience. It's very much a kind of subtle um, mood enhancing, cognitive enhancing um, natural supplement that gives people, you know, a bit of energy. It allows you to focus at work or if you're, you know, working out or if you're, I don't know, you're, you're having it going out for a couple, you know, having chats with friends. It really just works in any, any scenario where you want to be a bit more on um, and get into kind of that, that nice flow. So we started selling it in October uh, last year. Uh, we got it to the place where we were really happy with it. Um, and it's been, it's been selling really well. People really like it. We're getting great feedback. I would say a lot of the good feedback is around less around energy and definitely more around mood. Uh, so people just feeling good. You know, they, they're focused. They're feeling good. They're not having these ups and downs. Um, so we've got one flavor right now, which is a kind of tangy tangerine, but we've got two other flavors dropping uh, in a couple of months, all with the same bioactives, but just slightly different flavors for people to try available in the US and in Canada, and then uh, we'll be expanding out to, to Europe. And so that's our first product, but we've got a bunch of different things that we're working on, all with the idea of taking natural supports and making them easier for people to take and taking different tools that seem a bit esoteric and making them accessible to people so they can either use these functional mushroom kind of supports or making tools to make uh, psychedelic experiences easier. So for example, we're making intention cards for people that are, you know, microdosing or microdosing where they can have these intention cards, they can plan, you know, before an experience. We're making um, a, a new, sub a new uh, strip that's good for people that have a little bit of anxiety so they can take it and they feel a little bit calmer. Uh, we're making some cool, eye masks and blankets for experience, psychedelic experiences. We're making a, a tool that allows you to restore your microdose or microdose a little bit more effectively so they don't dry out. So everything that we're doing is to enable people to use these substances outside of just the clinical framework. We want them to be able to use them in their day-to-day -day lives more effectively. So that's where Mojo and all of this stuff's coming from. Amazing. And yeah, I just, I just recently was reading about how 
you know, people that are looking for more energy or being in that flow state, you know, the caffeine is great to give you more energy, but the reason why most people can't maintain the flow state is because of anxiety. That's why you keep, you know, shifting. Oh, I got to look at my phone. I got to, you know, so Mojo actually has that in it where it kind of has that calming portion right. as well. So right. it's, that's what really helps keep you in the flow state because has the energy plus the Exactly. And we didn't want people to yeah, ride, ride a tiger and then kind of crash out. And that's what common, commonly people have is like, you know, one o'clock in the afternoon, oh, I need another coffee or I need another whatever it is that, that people take. And, you know, coffee, I love coffee. I drink it in the morning. I'm never going to give up coffee, but I, I have my kind of coffee and then I'll do my mojo probably around 10, 11. And that carries me through to the rest of the day. And the other trend we were noticing was just this huge growth in energy supplements, but most of them having enormous kind of toxic baggage to mm -hmm. them. Um, so, you know, in, in South Korea and Asia, there's a lot of problems with kids drinking energy drinks, playing video games all day, and then getting skin problems and liver problems, because this stuff just is That's not toxic. good yeah. for the body long term. And so we wanted to create something that was you know, plant-based that could substitute that, that was still easy and tasty, um, but that would give people that same kind of focused energy and, and productivity. Sounds amazing. I definitely want to try it. Now, there are also many non-psychedelic mushrooms that are really beneficial for our health. I know lion's mane is a great one, and that's one of the ingredients in Mojo. What are a few of the most, you know, beneficial non-psychedelic mushrooms, and what are their health benefits? Yeah, so... And this is this is like come about in the last I would say five six years in the West. It's become you know a little bit more visible. Um, but in the East, uh, people have been using these uh, mushrooms for a long time. And reishi and cordyceps and all of these different mushrooms have been a staple in certainly Chinese culture, uh, Nepalese, Tibetan. So we're really just discovering this in in the West. And there's some brands out there that have made it more popular. I would say the the biggest most popular mushrooms would be lion's mane, um, which yes, is in our um, supplement. Lion's mane incidentally is also, I think the most tasty mushroom. It's kind of hard to get. It looks like uh, a lion's mane, it's white, it has this overflowing kind of tendrils, um, but it, people call it the lobster of the mushroom world. It's so you can fry it up with garlic. It's really tasty, it's delicious and it's healthy. Um, but that's a very popular one for people to take for brain health. Um, chaga mushroom is a very popular one. Chaga is this um, conch looking mushroom that grows on the side of trees, um, typically in Siberia and Canada. Um, and you can have it in teas, people might have seen it in coffees, but you could just take, you know, there's tablets out there, there's sprays. Chaga is packed full of antioxidants. So there's a variety of things that antioxidants are good for getting rid of free radicals, things like that. But typically people will take chaga because it's a very good immune booster. Uh, so it's very good for the immune system. Um, I'm actually, I'm drinking some chaga tea right now. It's not non-caffeinated, so I, I drink that daily. Reishi mushroom is this crazy looking red one um, that again has a bunch of antioxidants, beta glucans in it, very good for general health. Um, turkey tail is good for immunity. Turkey tail looks like this again, weird like plate that comes out of a tree. And then the final one I would say that's really becoming quite popular is called cordyceps, which is also in, um, in Mojo. Cordyceps is one of the few mushrooms that you take and you notice a, a very noticeable short-term impact. Most of them kind of, you know, they, you take them for general health, but it's not like you feel it right then and there. Cordyceps is a stimulant. You take it and you kind of, you, in the East, it's been used as a, a kind of aphrodisiac as well as kind of an energy supplement. Um, and uh, it's, it's interesting. I mean, it used to be incredibly expensive and rare and sought after. It was only found in Nepal. Wow. It, this is gross, so don't let this put you, put you off. But it was a, it's a kind of uh, parasitic mushroom that it grows out of the back of caterpillars. So it invade their body and then grow out the back. And then people would go and harvest this stuff and they would use it for all the different things they used for. But obviously that made it very expensive. You've got to go and pick up 
caterpillars from Nepal uh, is going to be very expensive. So, um, but now there's ways to to, to grow it, and uh, Mojo actually has a, a a variety called Cordyceps sinensis CS4, which is doesn't taste for doesn't isn't bitter at all, and is very potent. So, um, it's a really interesting, strong mushroom. It, it forms the backbone of why Mojo gives you the energy that it does. Um, so, I, I, those are kind of the main ones. But there's honestly just hundreds of mushrooms out there um, that do a variety of different things even you know just the the bog standard mushrooms that people eat these are uh, superfoods they really are that then they're, they're, you know they're packed full of good stuff whether it's you know the oyster mushrooms or shiitake mushrooms or maitake mushrooms or whatever it is packed full of amazing substances so mushrooms in diet is is really important. And then these functional ones layering on as supplements are, you know, they just do a world of good for people. And so anybody that cares about natural health really should be looking at, you know, mushrooms as something that can help them with a variety of different, a variety of different supports in day-to-day -day life. Yeah. And this, the one you were talking about, Choga, the one you're drinking, that one's, I mean, immune boosting, that's what we all need right now for sure. Exactly. And, and are most of these that you mentioned, are they easy to get? Like they are. They are they're, they're they're easy easy to get, but with a caveat that you know when something becomes popular, you get a lot of people selling a lot of stuff, and there's you know there's there's a lot of stuff out there that just isn't good quality, um, and so there's there's a few brands. Paul Stamets is a mycologist um, that's on the documentary Fantastic Fungi. He has a really good brand um the you know quality but you're really looking for yeah quality brands i mean obviously look at the reviews um there's a bunch of kind of coffee teas out there mud water four sigmatic um so there's a there's a bunch of ways to to get this um but personally for me the best way for, to to get chaga is i buy on amazon you can buy chaga lumps and you mm. just put it on your stovetop Fill up, fill up a pot with water and just keep it on a low heat, heat all day. And it just, that's a natural process of extracting the chaga. Uh, and then you can just drink that kind of chaga water tea all day long. So that's, that's what I do. You don't even have to buy like the tea bags or anything like that. Okay, thanks for sharing that. I'm definitely gonna try that. Um, <laughs> And I also noticed on your website that you did have some sort of mushroom growing kit where yeah. you can kind of grow your own. Yeah, it's still on the uh, still on the roadmap, I and mean, we've we've been trying to work out a way that to make mushroom growing easy and accessible, but also nice looking. Because most of most of the mushroom kits you can get now are essentially mycelium that's been uh, inoculated into a bag of sawdust, and then you get the bag, you cut it open, and the you spray it, and the mushroom kind of grows out, but looks kind of funky it's not you know you've got to have these mist tents it's it's not the most user-friendly process so my myco is the thing we've been working on that we really want to make mushroom growing like succulents like we want people to be able to look at them and make them kind of you know nice looking on tables trendy. <laughs> yeah trendy uh, but easy to do and so we're, we're still working on that right now the next product that we'll we'll be releasing is probably the anxiety strips that we've been making and what's the future of Guala look like? Do you, um, you know, once there's a lot more legalization happening, is that something, you, are you going to shift into that industry? 100%, yeah, yeah. I mean, we're, 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 we're really trying to build up a, what, what we call kind of an ecosystem or platform that has products, that has contents, that has tools that can enable people to use these substances now, but obviously as, as states, come online and legalize will then start you know taking our brands and and wrapping them around different substances like psilocybin and there's been some really positive changes you mentioned them at the top of the show but you know oregon california washington has now introduced a a ballot for adult use legalization which is really exciting a lot of the states are kind of talking about therapeutic use but washington's kind of leapfrog that and is talking about adult use for anybody that wants access and so we're really at the beginning of an exciting time of entheogenic kind of acceptance in the U.S. specifically and in Canada as well. Yeah it sounds like it's following the same trajectory of marijuana. 
Exactly. What's interesting is, is the U.S. ahead of Canada with as far as legalization? It is. It is. Yeah. Canada, Canada has um, Canada has more companies looking at psychedelics in our kind of capital markets. And it has. But on the usage side, it's only really very edge case exemptions right now um, that people are allowed to take psilocybin for. So end of life, palliative care, things like that. Whereas in the U.S., you've got entire counties that are decriminalized, you know, Oakland and places like that, Portland. And so um, the, the, the pace is gonna be a lot faster, I think, state by state. Um, but that just speaks to the, to the amazing diversity that the US is, I think. I mean, Canada is basically a, uh, you know, a mono, it's a nation uh, with provinces, but it's very much federally kind of controlled. Whereas the US has this amazing system of state by state kind of individual choice um, and so, you know, kind of a recreationally legalized cannabis uh, federally, but the U.S. still hasn't done that. But you've got these pockets of states, California and New York, that are, that are, that are doing the same thing. So I think psychedelics are going to be a lot faster in, in the U.S. for sure. Now, you're obviously very passionate about the benefits of mushrooms and psychedelics. Um, can you share with us a bit of your personal journey and what types of benefits that you've experienced with psychedelics? Yeah, I mean, so I grew up in the UK, um, growing up in England, um, magic mushrooms are actually legal for a period of time. So, you know, when I kind of came of age and started exploring this stuff, first cannabis, you know, rock music, that kind of stuff. And then 16, 17, we wanted to try um, psychedelics and you could go into a store. Um, so you'd go into your head shop, my local one was called Salamanders. So we'd go to Salamanders and buy some mushrooms. We'd go off into the forest and me and my friends would take these um, you know, quite long seven, eight hour trips. And wow. that was just some of the, you know, most profound and slash most terrifying experiences that I've, that I've ever had because they're you know, completely uncontrolled, had no idea what we were doing. Um, but, you know, some of those experiences were life-changing. I mean, I, I distinctly remember the first, um, the first trip where the, you get the kind of onset of euphoria, the kind of on-ramp, that kind of very much a kind of MDMA type feeling and, you know, just wanting to tell people about this. And it's funny, like the first person I could think of, I remember my 16 year old brain was like, oh, I need to tell my mom about this amazing experience. <laughs> Thankfully, my friends stopped me from doing it. But those, those initial kind of feelings uh, I just didn't know you could experience that level of consciousness or that kind of empathy and that you know all of those kind of things so it just it made me really interested in consciousness alteration and you know what you can do and what was what was you know the difference between the mind and the body and you know all of that type of stuff that propelled me into exploring meditation and you know all of that kind of wonderful world but I do remember one trip early on that, and I didn't suffer from, and I still don't like, it's not like I've had major trauma. I'm fortunate enough to have, you know, a nice childhood, all of that kind of stuff. So I was going into these trips with, you know, an open palate. Uh, but what I did suffer from was kind of a, I think a fairly significant ego. Um, I wasn't a bully, but I could bully be, I had kind of, I could have those negative behaviors. I could be quite mean um, to people around me, but also quite mean to, you know, strangers and kids that, you know, whatever look different or whatever it was. And I, I think that's partly a young male growing up, but also there was some, I, know, I, I think I definitely had a little bit more of that than other kids. And I remember one trip early on where um, I felt the, I felt like I was bullying myself. I was doing this kind of stuff in my trip and I was feeling that pain right back at me. And so it's mm. one thing to intellectually know you can be mean and be like, oh yeah, I can be mean sometimes, but it's another thing to feel the weight of your own bullying. And it's, it sounds trite to say, but I was like, oh, you know, I'm causing this pain. And of course I should have known I'm causing pain, but you can kind of dismiss it. But once I felt that pain, um, it was really like a, a revelatory experience for me. And I came out of that. I'm not saying I became a saint, hmm. uh, but I definitely thought a lot more about how I treated people and the mitigated that those behavior. And I really do credit psychedelics as making me a much nicer 
mm. empathetic person early on. So th that was my path into it. And then I really got into, you know, other legal botanicals. I explored a lot of different substances and, you know, MDMA and, you know, legal, non-legal, and just kind of was very interested in the effects, like what it would do to me, what buttons I could push in this kind of biochemical computer, but also, um, you know, the, the cultural history of it and the background and why people do this stuff. And so that's one of the, honestly, was the biggest reason why I wanted to create Guella was because <laughs> I saw very early on that psychedelics we're having this renaissance but there's there's a very dominant conversation going on and most of the capital has moved into this space of you know how do we take this natural substance patent it make it into a pharmaceutical drug for a very specific disorder and i wanted to approach it from an open access ethos but also from an ethos where people shouldn't just be suffering from disorders as defined by the pharmaceutical industry to be able to get access to this stuff. I think historically, people have used these substances for much more than just fixing disorders. I think people do now, I think people will in the future. And I fundamentally believe people have the right to experiment with their own consciousness without interference. I think that's a fundamental human right. So Guella really was created out of that want to challenge some of the narrative in the industry and recontextualize psychedelics as tools to create not just drugs to fix kind of breaking that paradigm I don't want psychedelics just to fall into that paradigm again right that's so important and that's what this show is all about is really kind of shifting that consciousness around what healthcare is and it's not just take a pill for this or you know yeah there's a holistic approach to it and and we need to be you know we need to gain our own knowledge and learn about ourselves and be able to heal ourselves. So mm -hmm. I love that. I love what your company is doing. And that's fascinating what, you know, mushrooms did for you. It really kind of created or helped you feel that interconnectedness, you know, on a very vis vis visceral level. Which is fascinating. Right. I was just yeah, thinking, no. I'm like, how can we crop dust the entire world <laughs> <laughs> on a daily basis? So sounds like we'd have a lot less wars and strife and people no, being assholes. I mean, that's, <laughs> you know, it sounds utopian, uh, but I really think that widespread intentional usage of psychedelics can improve the world um, and help us answer a lot of the you know, big questions that we have. I mean, they they obviously make you feel more connected to other people, which is what we need. We need less tribalism. We need more connectedness, Absolutely. more understanding. They make you feel what's called biophilia. So they make you feel more connected to nature and other sentient beings. And we need to be treating the environment and the world with a lot more respect. So I think they can help on you know, the, the questions of climate change. Um, so th these kind of big things that we're, that we're dealing with, and also that there's a there's a kind of spiritual malaise that we've fallen into as we've kind of knocked the legs out of uh, old monotheistic religions. We haven't really replaced it with anything. Um, and so people still crave that meaning and that higher purpose. But the only thing we kind of reach for in uh, our society is kind of, you know, the only thing we compete on is kind of, you know, money and you know those kind of things which is important this kind of capitalist kind of machine but people don't extract existential meaning from winning at their job and so psychedelics can really help with introducing profundity and meaning to people's lives and i'm not saying it's the only thing you know meditation yoga whatever it is but people strive for that and i think it's one tool that we can deploy in the toolkit to bring more meaning to people's lives hmm. absolutely now, for those who'd like to check out your products, I'm going to post a link below where we can all purchase and learn more about your nutraceutical mojo, and then as well as your company, Guella Mushrooms. And what can we find on your website? Is there anything in the works coming up to share or what can, what can we expect going on? Yeah, so you can find Mojo at mojo.shop. Um, there's, like I said, there's one at the moment, one flavor. There'll be three flavors uh, by next month, we hope. Um, on Guella Mushrooms, um, there's no products to buy. That's kind of like the overall company. But what we are starting to do, we've got 200 articles that are getting ready to drop um, this month, 
all different guides on how to use these substances and you know what to do, how to do it, uh, where to buy stuff from, things like that. We have a podcast called Super Psychedelic, where we interview different people in the world of psychedelics that you know, might be interesting to people. So those are the those are the main two. Obviously, we're on all of the the socials and things like that, Instagram and and Twitter. So feel free to follow us there. But mojo.shop and guelamushrooms.com are the, the main places. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your wisdom and all things mushrooms and psychedelics. It was very enlightening and such a beautiful conversation. I really enjoyed My it. Pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Remember, knowledge is power. The more you understand about your body, the better you're able to stay healthy and prevent disease. And a quick reminder, I'm not your doctor, so please don't take this as medical advice. If you have specific questions about your specific health care, feel free to reach out to your practitioner. And if you like this video, please like and share it with others. This information could really help some you may know. And hit that subscribe button to be sure you don't miss out on our future shows. And stay tuned for the next episode of Discovering True Health. Help.